after four weeks, uh, I'm back in action and I will be switching to the video market outlooks that I have been posting recently. Let's start with the earnings calendar for next week. So with earnings, the season has pretty much uh, died down. Uh, we do have some interesting earnings, uh, for example, Lenar, this home builders, that's always an interesting one. We have Accenture, that's one of the stocks in our watch list. That's going to be interesting, but outside of that, it's pretty dead. And earnings season will start heating up again around second week of July. So at least we have some respite until then, because you know how crazy earnings season is. Like every day, some, you know, Netflix, Apple, Microsoft, all these stocks will start reporting earnings. And these trillion dollar companies have the potential of moving the markets dramatically so it's very hard to plan trades because your trades might all be looking really good and some earnings comes out and everything changes in the in the matter of like a single day so at least for next um, three weeks there are no earnings so that's good news let's switch to the macroeconomic calendar so this is a screenshot of my market outlook from last week and if you remember last week was pretty intense because we had core CPI on Wednesday which is a huge market mover and we did see a major market move on that day and that was followed by the FMC interest rate decision and Powell conference. Now if you remember um, CPI was tamer than expected and markets loved that. The interest rate decision was uh, already known that they're going to hold the interest rate. So there was nothing special about that. But the Powell conference right after the FOMC rate decision is always a major market moving event because people are always looking for clues as to what the Fed plans to do in the upcoming meetings. And if you remember, Powell was very hawkish, surprisingly, because he has been dovish all throughout the year and saying that in inflation is under control, we are doing great. But this time his tone was uh, slightly on the hawkish side and he said that, yes, we love the CPI data that came out this morning, but one data point is not enough for us to consider an interest rate cut. Federal Reserve in its June meeting leaving interest rates unchanged and continues to say that it won't be appropriate to cut interest rates until it's gained confidence that it's headed towards its 2% target. The Fed on average now projecting one rate cut this year down from three in the March forecast. Four officials in fact are projecting no cuts this year up from only two in March. One official actually says no cuts this year or next year. No cuts for you. Surprisingly, the markets completely ignored that. So nobody cared about his dovish statement because the CPI was good that morning. Market shot up. Then next day we had PPI and jobless claims. PPI was also tame, tamer than expected. And the jobless claims were actually higher than expected. So all these three are actually um, data points which Fed considers. So they want the jobs market to slow down. They want the inflation to come down. So all these three data points are actually pointing towards that. So what was interesting was that markets shot up on these two data points. But uh, I'll switch to the charts in a bit and show you that yes, QQQ, uh, tech, and SPY are still pretty bullish but for some reason Dow Jones is unable to sustain any kind of uh, price spikes so any data point like this comes out all market indices shoot up and then Dow Jones for some reason sells off and we will also talk about this when I uh, bring up the sector rotation graph because it will show you something interesting uh, when we get there Okay, so now let's look at what's happening next week. That was a reflection on last week. So next week, th next week, thankfully, there is nothing happening. So no CPI, no PPI, no PCE. Uh, we do have, you know, the jobs data which comes out every Thursday, but that's 
and that's always a market mover but outside of that there is nothing going on if you, it's just a list of uh, fed speakers just talking so there is nothing really going on next week which i'm pretty happy about so let's see technical analysis will become more reliable next week because we don't have all these market moving uh, binary events happening next week but before you get too excited the following week if you look at the following week's calendars things will start heating up again so for example thursday this is june 27th we have the gdp number coming out and then friday we have core pce which is a huge market mover so cpi ppi all these things yes they affect the markets but the fed actually pays attention to pce that is their preferred gauge of inflation and all these data points that come out in the past they actually feed into that so my guess is if cpi and ppi were better than expected i'm guessing pce will also be better than expected and uh, we could see markets shoot up so it's going to be a tricky week i would suggest to not trade too much until friday and this is two weeks ahead this is not next week and uh, even if you take some trades that week save some capital for friday so, so that's the next two weeks all right so now let's quickly touch upon the relative rotation graph which shows you how money is flowing in the markets i will link a video in the description which actually shows you how to interpret this graph properly but if you remember there are four quadrants improving lagging weakening and leading and if i switch to last week i'll just switch to this is the week before so if you remember xle energy sector was an xle utilities uh, these are part of dow jones they were in the leading quadrant and xlk and xly which are growth or the risk on sentiment of the market they were in the lagging quadrant so i was saying that for the markets to go up in a secular manner for us to have a secular bull market the risk on sectors uh, need to money needs to flow into the risk on sectors like xlk which is tech and xly which is consumer discretionary and it wasn't happening now of course uh, Nvidia earnings came out that changed a lot of things and Nvidia and in fact Broadcom if you remember last week Broadcom another chip chip stock came out and then now if you look at what's happening now this week look at XLK it actually went up into the improving quadrant so tech is beginning to look bullish again but it's too early to say because it's just gone from the lagging to improving quadrant it needs to go into the leading quadrant for Q's and SPY to keep going up. Another interesting thing that happened was if you look at XLE, which is the energy sector. If you remember, I have two trades on uh, ENPH for the same week, uh, which is Enphase Energy, and I took that trade because energy sector was looking bearish to me. And as is pretty common with mean reversion trading, you can never pin pinpoint the exact time. when a stock is about to turn so you have to make your you have to make an educated guess and which i did for enph i took a trade it went against me then i took another like average down trade on enph for the same expiration that also initially went against me but now if you look at xle it's actually dropping from leading it is moving towards weakening and i will show you a chart on xle too which kind of confirms this and now if you look at the two trades i took on e and ph they are they are in the money so it looks like both of them will be winners and if xle continues down this path you you could consider taking trades on other energy stocks there are many stocks you know conco philips cop eog there is there are a bunch of stocks uh, pxd you could consider taking trades on those stocks again to summarize The relative rotation graphs are showing that XLI and XLF, XLI, XLF, XLB, XLY, all of these are part of Dow Jones, and all of these are moving into the weakening quadrant. And when I pull up the chart for DIA, you will see that Dow Jones is actually 
pulling back it's unable to sustain uh, any price upward price movements and this is being reflected in the individual sectors that dow jones is made of so if you are looking for um, bearish setups in the coming weeks consider financials industrials um, utilities energy so there are lot of opportunities for you if you want to consider bearish setups xlk i would stay away from that because you know nvidia earnings kind of changed the narrative again and you saw what happened with apple last week and that also kind of helped propel tech nspy up so do not take avoid taking bearish trades on tech until we see uh the leaders like apple microsoft um nvidia all of these start pulling back okay let's switch to some charts and if you look at qqq it's on a monster move up so look at rsi it's in overbought but it's going up look at adx which is sharply pointing up which points to more upside in the in the coming week unless that adx line turns down there is no loss in upward momentum and this could continue going up and this was fueled by let me pull up some stocks why is this happening so of course the main culprit is nvidia we had a 10 is to 1 split on 11 june and then even after the split the stock doesn't stop it's continuing to go up so nvidia is leading the charge followed by apple if you remember this just this was this day i think 610 was wwdc the uh, the developer conference for apple and right after that day nothing happened on that day they yes they announced uh, apple intelligence their own ai uh, their own branding of ai and how they're going to put uh, chat gpt on your phone the next day we saw this huge move in apple i mean apple doesn't it's a, it's a trillion dollar market cap company it doesn't move like this this is like a pink sheet kind of a move that we are seeing here there was a huge move and the next day we saw a similar size candle again and i did i did try to take a trade on apple bearish trade like 222 to 15 put spread but i it didn't fail so i couldn't take that but uh, i have a feeling that this move will reverse to some extent i don't think apple will go back to where it was but we should see apple coming back to 200s in the near future in the next could be next 2 3 weeks so apple uh nvidia and microsoft these are the you know the three big movers of the market look at microsoft the stock is continuing to go up so as long as microsoft apple and nvidia are bullish we'll see qs and spy keep going up now let's switch to dia which is dow jones etf that's what i was talking about earlier in the sector uh, rotation graph the relative rotation graph is that Dow Jones is the only market component which is not participating in this rally. So what I've been noticing is in the morning like in the pre-market whatever news comes out could be CPI, PPI, jobless claims uh all market uh, indices will shoot up on good news but Dow Jones sells off by the end of the day. So that's a very interesting behavior I'm seeing and that points to money flowing out of dow components and you can see in this chart that all the qqq and spy are at the top of their trading range dow jones got rejected at this level and begin to drop again so i don't know what to make out of it yet but um dow jones could lead the entire market into a pullback of course we are seeing no signs of that happening because until the tech leaders Slow, slow down that's not going to happen or dow jones could just fall on its own and which is basically sector rotation so money will flow out of all dow components it will go back into the risky assets 
the the tech, the consumer discretionary stock, and all that stuff. And that's a, like, that's a welcome scenario because the thing is, when this happens, when the markets don't drop together, money flows out of only a one component that gives you a lot of trading opportunity because you can simply analyze the relative rotation graphs, figure out which sectors money is coming out of. You can take bearish trades on those and then you can see which sectors money is flowing into. You can actually take bullish trades on those. So you, you can have a combination of bullish and bearish trades and, and both sets of trades could become profitable. Okay, let's look at VIX real quick. So VIX is again hovering around all time lows. So VIX is not pointing to any upcoming correction. All I'm seeing is just uh, money coming out of dark components and flowing into tech and consumer discretionary. That's all I'm seeing. Um, one interesting thing is, uh, I'm, if you remember, I mentioned XLE or I mentioned energy, right? So if you pull up XLE, it's looking very bearish and I was I showed you in the RRG chart also that it was in the leading quadrant but it's now dropping into the weakening quadrant and that could mean that there will be trading opportunities that will show up in the XLE sector. Okay this uh, brings me back to this question somebody posted on Friday which I couldn't get to because it was outside of my business hours. But uh, I'll just address this question here. So uh, this gentleman is asking, I need some guidance of taking trades to save the sinking trades. Understand if the put spreads are losing, then when and how do we balance the portfolio with bull calls? Isn't there a risk the market turns around and bull calls are at risk too? So yes, that risk is always there. And if you remember, my main recommendation is uh, let's start with a small example. So let's say you have a really small account and you take only two trades a week. You can use the portfolio allocation calculated on my website, uh, which shows you that um, how much, how many trades are you allowed to take every week based on your portfolio size. So let's say you are only allowed to take two trades a week. So what I've been recommending is that because there are so many binary events, macroeconomic events and data being released all the time that it's very hard to predict with any degree of certainty which direction markets are going. So if you are only taking two trades a week, I would suggest take your first trade based on whatever your directional bias is. So let's say you are bearish on the markets. On Monday or Tuesday, if you find a good setup, take that trade and then save the second trade for Friday. And the reason for that is, is most of the uh, this macroeconomic data uh, like C CPI, PPI, jobless claims, GDP, these are released between Wednesday and Friday. So if you wait until Friday, all of this data would have already been released and whichever direction the markets are supposed to go they would have already done that move so let's say you were bearish on the markets and cpi came out on wednesday and cpi was bad what will happen is markets will start tanking so you, the bearish trade that you took on monday will automatically become a winner and then you could on friday the trade that you save for friday if you wait you'll always find new trade setups every day. There are so many stocks out there and there are approximately 200 stocks in my watch list. So there is never a shortage of trade ideas. So wait till Friday based on the what markets did by then you take the second trade. So giving you another example, let's say you took a bearish trade on Monday and CPI actually came out good on Wednesday and markets reverse direction. So now that bearish trade you took on Monday is looking dicey. So that could become a loser. So now with debit spreads, you know, uh, usually what happens is your losses don't pile up instantly because uh, the when you buy naked calls and puts, stock starts going away from you. 
you will instantly start seeing losses mount up. But with debit spreads or just spreads in general, the the spread value doesn't deteriorate that quick. So on Friday, if the markets turn against you, you could consider taking a bullish trade on some stock, which is showing a good trade setup. And what that will achieve for you is that you will um, end up kind of canceling your loser that you took on Monday. And if you are following the loss management rules that I teach you, which is using PNR, the point of no return, and the 50% loss rule, and you close, if you have the discipline to close that trade, the losing trade on from Monday, then that trade will be closed at 50% loss, but the trade you took on Friday could be, uh, uh, let's say it becomes a winner, you will still end up making money. Now, in this case, this gentleman is also asking, what if the market turns around and the bull calls are at risk too? So there is only one guarantee in the stock market that there are no guarantees. So that can always happen. The only thing that is in our control is to make logical decisions based on the rules that we have in place. Now, what markets do after you put a trade on is not in your control. And one more thing that I always remind our members is that hedging is um, a last resort. So hedging should not be part of your regular trading. So the first thing you need to do is if you ever have a week where you have more losers than winners, you need to cut down your trading volume in the following week. So if you are taking four trades a week and uh, it, eventually it will happen to you that all four all four trades become losers or maybe three trades become losers, only one winner. Now, when that happens, you need to cut down your trading volume by half in the following week. Because what that means is if you have more losers than winners, that means you are getting market direction wrong. And when markets start going in a particular direction, they usually continue going in that direction. And if you are getting market direction wrong, instead of trying to hedge your losers, you cut down your trading volume until the time that you start seeing winners again, and then you start ramping up your trading volume. So if you take four trades a week, let's say all four were losers, in the following week, you take only two trades. And let's say those two trades are also losers. Then in the following week, you take only one trade. Now, that, let's say that trade becomes a winner. Then now you have the confidence to uh, start doubling your trades. So let's say you take two trades in the coming week. Now those two trades become winners. Then you start taking four trades. So that's how you need to constantly tweak and adjust market exposure. Because when you have a winner, when you have a winning week, it basically means that your directional assessment of the market is right. And you are trading with the trend. And in that case, you need to ramp up your trading volume. When you start getting losers, that means you're no matter what your uh, analysis is, you're still getting market direction wrong. So you need to cut down exposure. So hedging only comes into play when you are all, already following this uh, rule of tweaking your portfolio exposure based on your performance. So hedging is this, uh, a last resort. So I hope that uh, makes sense. And going forward, I plan to include any interesting question that I find during the week on our Discord server and address them in the weekend market outlook and see if it helps you guys. So uh, keep asking questions. If I find any interesting questions, which I feel the whole group can benefit from, I will address them in my videos. See you next week.